Okay, so uh, guten Abend, der Fest Vienna uh, 2015. Uh, my name is Jan Jaskowski. I uh, work as a software engineer for uh, Red Hat. Maybe some of you know where the uh, Linux distribution or Fedora. Uh, and uh, I came here to speak about uh, uh, methods, how to sandbox and isolate uh, in general, in operating system in general. Um, uh, maybe about the agenda we will cover today, some uh, motivation. Uh, why to care about uh, sandboxing and isolation of processes. Uh, then we will cover um, isolation from application level approach. Uh, we will proceed to funny fudge sandboxes. Uh, we will detail some uh, operating system concepts behind uh, uh, sandboxing technology. And uh, uh, at, the at the end we will show how sandboxing can be used not, not just uh, to ensure security but also like uh, development or application platform. So why to why uh, take care for uh, sandbox, sandboxing and uh, isolation? Of course the first um, goal or Concern might be security, it's the prim primary um, motivation. Um, maybe two points here. Um, often it's uh, announced uh, sandboxing and isolation like it's the business of the uh, endpoint user, like the end user uh, should be the one who should take care for the uh, sandboxing. Uh, uh, applying uh, methods or applications for isolation. Uh, not less, uh, currently it's announced the role of the developer when creating applications like to ap apply uh, the techniques for isolation uh, directly into the uh, process of uh, developing uh, the product. The second, second uh, motivation, and it's very recent, it's independence. Uh, sandboxing not only brings uh, security, but with, uh, there are also projects that are trying to create something like uh, independent um, platforms for running applications. Uh, independence in the sense uh, you wouldn't uh, need to uh, focus on the details of the uh, underlying operating system that uh, uh, independent uh, platform should be self-standing enough to be able to um, provide the environment for the uh, running application. So, I have uh, mentioned that uh, uh, there are uh, two um, roles uh, how to approach uh, sandboxing or isolation like uh, the classical case when uh, it should be the responsibility of the administrator, system administrator or the, and the user to take care for uh, sandboxing. Uh, I don't know, you would like to visit some uh, uh, flash enabled uh, web page and before um, launching or visiting that page you would uh, uh, run uh, Firefox or uh, web browser in general in some other application to uh, provide that sandbox for you. Uh, so users would uh, uh, take care for um, tasks like uh, um, managing how many uh, CPU cycles, memory or uh, disk size, uh, it, uh, the process uh, running some action would be allowed to use. Example, you would uh, limit the uh, Firefox web browser uh, to be able to use certain, uh, certain amount of memory. 
uh, also you can the user would uh, make things like uh, ensure uh, processes can interact together or can interact together only in the uh, way you would like uh, you would like to de de uh, to define that way. Uh, in, the, in this uh, classical approach, developers uh, are somehow old, like uh, they have uh, the vision or idea, like they just provide the uh, source code, uh, the tarballs, and they don't need to uh, take care about the um, sandboxing or isolation of the pro product. Uh, recently, uh, it has uh, shown or it can be uh, seen a uh, slight uh, change in this approach how uh, the developers are percepting uh, the, um, producing of their software products in the sense they are trying to apply um, techniques or methods for isolation directly when creating the product like uh, for example instead of using one uh, standalone server process they are using uh, child, child processes to separate the tasks to uh, uh, at least uh, as minimum as possible. Like uh, one child would do just uh, one small uh, part of, of the whole job which needs to be done and uh, that child would uh, perform the task with uh, minimal uh, privileges. So, um, application approach uh, to isolation. First uh, use case I will mention is the uh, taint mode, so-called taint mode of the pair, on which not sure how many of you are uh, familiar with uh, uh, pair language. Uh, the taint mode it's uh, based on the concept of uh, like uh, clean and uh, dirty data, like. Uh, at the, at the beginning, uh, all the data are considered uh, dirty, and uh, it's uh, during the process of running the application you are um, wandering the data, like uh, blessing which parts of the data um, can be considered safe. Um, I have said that all the data have been uh, are considered dirty, but there are a couple of exceptions, like. Uh, uh, arguments of uh, print or syswrite, uh, system calls or functions, pair functions are not considered for uh, not checked for tentiness and some uh, advanced uh, pair language structures like uh, symbolic methods and uh, symbolic sub-references. Uh, important point here is uh, hash keys are never, uh, never tainted. They are by default like um, safe, clean. Uh, uh, it's possible to detect uh, if uh, the data is uh, tamed, like there's a uh, routine in the module uh, for that. And uh, the uh, cleaning of the data is uh, uh, performed by uh, using values as uh, keys in your hash or uh, uh, referencing uh, subpatterns uh, from a certain um, match of regular expression. There is one problem here. I'm not sure if one, uh, if someone can see it with, with this approach. The issue is um, the last sentence. Um, the concept of uh, cleaning, cleaning the data. Uh, mm, as you know, regular expressions can be expressed in uh, many ways. Uh, they are, they are, mostly they are greedy, and uh, two uh, regular expressions, though they uh, look uh, identical or similar, have um, um, some of one of one of them is more secure uh, than the other. So the issue is that the whole. Um, concept of the pair mode uh, stays or falls down 
with the, with the way how you write those regular expressions. If you write them uh, in an unsafe way, the whole concept of the time mode is falling down and uh, it's, it's worthless, it it's, uh, means, means nothing. Uh, another use case is the safe module of uh, the pair language. Um, this is uh, some uh, advanced approach in the sense it introduced the uh, concept of so-called safe compartments where each compartment it's some like a um, room in the building with, with walls. Uh, each compartment has a uh, new namespace and operator mask. Uh, the namespace is uh, created each time when you create a new instance of that module. Uh, interesting is that code uh, which is um, executed and uh, evaluated uh, within that compartment can't uh, refer, uh, can't see, can touch variables variables outside and if you want to pass some variable some variable values to that code you need to define uh, some uh, variables operator mask specifies basically what actions you can uh, perform or, uh, at that data uh, default value is uh, um, default or operation tag and it's um, some uh, label or shortcut. Maybe I forgot to say each each uh, part of the text which is uh, uh, expressed in blue color. It's it's linked. So you can, if you would uh, see that presentation later, you can you can follow the those links and uh, get more information about that. That default uh, optag is uh, uh, some label. Um, like set of operators uh, that are considered uh, unsafe uh, by, by default. And there are methods for uh, uh, those uh, compartment objects, like uh, you can list uh, which of the uh, operators can be permitted, can, can be denied. Uh, you can even share operators between, between the two uh, compartments, etc. The issue is uh, with the application level approach is uh, it just isn't secure. Well, despite the way it's announced, uh, there are uh, CDA stands for Common Vulnerability Enumeration. Uh, it's like official way how to express a security flaw in a concrete uh, package or product. And uh, as far as I know, those. Uh, uh, identifiers have been assigned uh, to these concrete cases. Let's look at another approach. Can oh. you, sorry, can you just quickly uh, quickly explain what the main attack vectors were for the main mode and for the safe mode? How did people get around it? Basically, uh, for the for the you you want the first case or the second one? Or doesn't matter. Doesn't matter. Just so that I have a brief understanding of how they how they can be circumvented. There, there. Um, if if I can return to the uh, one of the previous slides, uh, uh, there are exceptions for tent modes. The symbolic methods and sim symbolic sub references aren't checked for tentedness. They are they are considered considered to be safe, mm -hmm. and they. They provided input expressed uh, in, uh, uh, how to say, complex regular expressions, like using those uh, structures to bypass the, the checks. It's not like you would provide, uh, I don't know, hash or, or something, something uh, easy to to the application, but uh, you would, you you are providing basically the same value, but expressed in in the form of symbolic method or uh, symbolic sub-references to uh, use that feature of the tail mode that it will it will bust the data and uh, that way you are able to bypass uh, those 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 checks. 
Well, if you are interested, and uh, we'll have a look at uh, those links, uh, those uh, issues or those identifiers, they are basically described, and it's it's a uh, complex uh, ex exploitation. Like uh, it, it was the conditions uh, um, they were expo exploited under were pretty complex. Like uh, it was with some uh, post PostgreSQL. Uh, battle, uh, module and in combination, so it, it, it isn't easy, but it's possible. Okay, maybe it's, it's, it's enough or... Okay, so another approach for the... Um, we, will, we will move to the fully fledged sandboxes. Uh, the Java sandbox model, uh, maybe more familiar, will be more familiar to you. Basically, uh, as far as I know, there are three versions uh, of, of it. And uh, in, the, in the basic version, just the local code uh, was executed in the Java uh, virtual machine, and the remote code was executed in the sandbox. The 1.1 version of the uh, Java sandbox introduced, introduced something uh, called or something like concept of signed applet when uh, um, if you would have remote code in the, in the original approach or design it would it would be it would run in the sandbox in the 1.1 or 1.1 version uh, by marking uh, that uh, 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 applet black sign sign you would tell the Java virtual machine to move that remote code from uh, the sandbox and then execute it in the virtual machine itself. In the uh, version 2 of the uh, JDK uh, introduced uh, more security features. I will uh, speak in further detail on the next slide. Uh, basically, uh, three of them, bytecode verifier, applet, uh, applet class order and security manager. Uh, the bytecode uh, verifier checks uh, basically the basic syntax of the uh, Java code if it has, uh, if it follows the conventions the JVM um, expects, like uh, um, for, for, the, for what is worthy, um, like towards allocating memory and things like that. The cl class order uh, builds on top of, of these checks and uh, performs uh, verification like uh, are, we, are we allowed to uh, call this uh, class, are we allowed to call this, the methods of this class, are they public, or private, protected? And um, the third part is the Java security manager. And, and uh, uh, in the um, security manager, you can uh, you can uh, create uh, something like uh, complete security policy, like uh, define uh, which a class, which which method of which class can perform which action, and uh, if like uh, by uh, whitelisting, whitelisting or blacklisting, and if uh, the rule from that uh, manager is uh, like uh, activated the security exception is uh, drawn again a problem with the uh, java security security approach uh, jvm approach like uh, uh, um, the searching the cva data database for these three um, words like uh, java sandbox and escape uh, quickly, quickly finds uh, 57 cvs black so uh, um, application level as can be seen application level sandboxes uh, aren't uh, uh, ideal like from the point of view they are uh, trying to ensure all the things within that application and uh, we have seen that uh, there are there are cases when they are failing 
Another uh, approach of uh, standalone sandbox is a Linux sandbox. And it's based uh, on the observation that uh, if you run, run some application, uh, many of the tasks or many of the applications, uh, first thing that we'll do, we'll uh, check the location of your home, home directory and uh, temporary directory. Here is the workflow of the SL Linux Sandbox works. It creates the file system, creates new directories, one uh, in user's home directory and uh, second in uh, temporary uh, directory, then creates some uh, multi web label. Um, uh, copy provided input files into into home dir or and temporary directory. When uh, typically when when run when the sandbox is run, you are not allowed to access uh, files any files outside of uh, uh, the uh, directory outside of those uh, home di uh, directory and temporary directory for for that. Uh, sandbox. If you want to access some of, of the um, files uh, on the on the operating system, you need to uh, sp specifically list them on the on the command line when when running the sandbox. Uh, one of the things or one of the subsequent things is executing as uh, so-called as share uh, utility. Like uh, uh, it's doing uh, uh, unsharing uh, those uh, files, uh, bind mounting, uh, uh, setting execution context, uh, dropping Linux capabilities. I will speak about Linux cap capabilities later. So just now, quickly mentioning them. And uh, when you, when you switch off or turn off the sandbox, it delays the uh, temporary and home directories. Some of the options, uh, uh, basically on the manual page you can, you can uh, uh, get more details. Um, what's, what's interesting here is the minus X option. It's dedicated to go to running uh, graphical applications and uh, minus big C and uh, small C specify Linux capabilities and uh, C groups. Uh, minus uh, H or minus T are somehow um, intuitive, and the minus E are um, exactly used to list the files that should be included into into the sandbox when when you are listing concrete files, and big E for when you are providing it in the form of the directory. Uh, the minus T specify the type of the sandbox, like a um, set of um, operations or actions that sandbox, that application is able to uh, perform when run in that sandbox, like uh, uh, sandbox uh, mine T means no network access or uh, sandbox.net T means uh, all networks ports are open. I will check the time and uh, if it's maybe provide some example. Okay. Uh, namespaces. Linux kernel. Linux kernel namespaces. Mm. It's like. Uh, So far, we have uh, talked about uh, application uh, sandboxing and uh, applications uh, trying to perform the uh, isolation, but uh, without without uh, support from the operating system, without support from system calls uh, methods. These these uh, routines are uh, directly provided by the. Uh, Linux kernel. Uh, the Linux kernel namespaces is uh, some some way how to separate uh, things like uh, 
uh, networking, uh, mounting points, uh, uh, processes into into groups, and how to specify uh, how these groups can uh, work together. For example, when you use the process namespace, you you can specify that only these two processes, like running programs, are able to communicate together. And when uh, some other third process is trying to, uh, I don't know, terminate the two, it's it's not allowed. Maybe. An example, um, the, the utility, um, the kind of utility that, it, that it's used to create those namespaces is called uh, unshare. specify the, the path to the Azure utility and uh, told it to create new <laughs> new uh, UTS namespace. UTS namespace is for uh, separating the domain name and the uh, uh, host name. And the uh, minus R means uh, uh, map uh, root user. And uh, I, will, I will provide an example in the sense uh, this is the this is the host name of the of, of my system I'll change it If it changed, and uh, now if I find the mount, well, yes. system. What it means, what did happen, is like I have changed the host name of my machine within that uh, namespace and it's, it isn't visible from uh, outside of, the, of that namespace. It's, it's visible only in that cell or uh, namespaces use so basically uh, they were introduced in the Linux kernel and uh, there are different types like I mentioned before like uh, for 
process, uh, process namespaces, mount namespaces, and basically what was changed? Only three new system goals were introduced when, uh, uh, by creating a new namespace, you just need to specify the different flags of uh, the clone system call and that that kind of namespace is created for you. Uh, set the namespace, maybe it's uh, intuitive enough. I was to some process to join. Once uh, I have created that uh, uh, namespace to modify the host name and domain name, and I would run some application, I would uh, 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 find, identify its, uh, its process identifier and I would use a certain namespace to uh, instruct that uh, application to join that uh, namespaces I have created. And uh, I'm sure is the uh, utility I have um, basically shown. Um, maybe use uh, it's, uh, this is this is the uh, common help output of the of the Azure utility just to show the possibilities it provides uh, you know, what's what's possible what's possible to do with running Azure it's like uh, mount um, namespaces uh, uh, network namespaces process and so on like C C manual page for more information. Another, another example is uh, uh, like Unshare might be uh, look like uh, it's a special utility to do something, but uh, if someone uh, knows the IP uh, command, the, the concept of uh, namespaces have been introduced also to already existing uh, Linux commands like uh, for the for the IP command uh, net name namespace. You can add, delete, or identify, and things like that. Again, uh, more more about the concept of namespaces. Uh, just see these uh, manual pages. Capabilities. I have a question. Um, to maybe get an application for this, I, I haven't used it that much. I just know this exists. So. Um, could I, for example, define a new mount point and a mount namespace and say, well, I only want processes in that namespace to access that mount. Yeah. For example, I have data that I don't want to leak into my system, so that's what this can be used for. Yeah, right? yeah, that's ex exactly. You would, you would create new mount points uh, via the via the Azure utility, and uh, you would specify the process identifier of that uh, uh, program you are yeah. running and you would match together. And can I also combine this, like create um, a net namespace and a mount namespace, for example saying that if I access if I access this mount point, I cannot access the network. Is that possible to combine this somehow? I, I, I'm not sure, I would need to try that. Like, uh, okay. I, th I think, I suppose it's possible, like it, it, wouldn't, it wouldn't make sense uh, unshare just uh, restrict those uh, functions or the capabilities it provides just for one type of uh, a namespace at at the one time. Like you would, you would just uh, for first time you would create mount namespace, second time second na uh, network namespace. So I think it can combine those options, and uh, you can create more advanced uh, sandboxes this way. Okay. okay uh, capabilities, basically. Uh, why, why capabilities? Historically, there have been two uh, roles or two types of uh, users in the uh, Linux operating system, like uh, privileged and unprivileged. The privileged or root was able to do anything. When, if, if you are root, you are able to create, basically manage the system, but also destroy it. And unprivileged user is uh, some kind of uh, limited uh, access, like uh, you, know, you have specified uh, home directory and things like that. Uh, it has the history has shown that uh, this uh, splitting into two categories 
might might not be enough in uh, some cases. Like there there might be cases when you want something like um, middle user user able to do some of the task of, from the root, but uh, not have not not to have enough uh, capabilities. I don't know to set up set up a network or something like that. So it was introduced in the Linux kernel 2.2. And uh, it's uh, attribute, the capabilities attribute that it's uh, uh, persisting for uh, each uh, new thread you create in your application. There are various types of capabilities. Uh, basically, maybe the most um, interesting or important one is uh, Capsys admin means. Uh, if you have this, if the process have this capability, it's able to perform administrative operations. I don't know, cabinet admin, network related uh, operation, and things like that. Uh, another another operating system concept um, applicable to isolation is so, so called libsecomp or secomp. Um, I don't. Um, no, the, the um, origin of the name, but I, I assume it's it's secure compartments, like maybe. Uh, it's basically uh, an interface to uh, Linux kernel system call filtering. Not sure how many of you uh, know Wireshark or some packet fil filtering, uh, network packet filtering uh, approach, like you are um, defining rules which uh, um, packets car, uh, packets car uh, can can uh, come in and uh, which are blocked. So this is this is something similar, but not uh, on the level of uh, network packets, but on the level of system calls. You define which system calls are like allowed to continue and which of them are blocked. Like uh, if if uh, s some concrete uh, system call, it's it's trying to I don't know open uh, certain location. You can you can specify the actions what will be done uh, at that moment. Like uh, uh, filter action values. That's ex exactly that uh, those operations. Uh, you can uh, kill the process. Allow 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 kill the system call. Allow the system call or uh, create some concrete uh, error error number or error message. Uh, those filters you define, you can have, you can apply uh, various operations of, uh, on uh, those filters. Like having two filters, you can match them. Uh, uh, add uh, new architecture, uh, remove architecture. Uh, architecture now uh, it's it's mean in the sense of uh, uh, architecture supported in the Linux kernel, like. Uh, uh, 32 bit or 64 bit, uh, I don't know, uh, power PC and these th things like that. Uh, you can you can uh, check the uh, Cisco pri priority add rule into into the that filter. Um, add rule exactly. I think the difference is that in add rule you can specify a, a regular expression like um, you can specify multiple rows to be added into into that uh, filter. And uh, if someone doesn't like the C language in the sense it might seem too complex, there are also Python language bindings available for the Lipsec and I will show the example how, how it looks like in uh, in Python because maybe it would be it would be for sure it, that that code would be longer in uh, written in C just. Now it's like I don't know two six uh, two four six rows six, uh, six rows uh, to perform some operation mm -hmm. via the Python bindings. Like you initialize the library, define those rows, like create the filter, define uh, define the rows you want to be applied to those system calls, and uh, load that filter you have just created into the Linux kernel, and that's it. Here we are creating a rule for uh, with default action like killing killing the that uh, system system call 
like uh, stopping it from uh, continuing, and we uh, define two rules like uh, uh, LO, LO open system call and uh, LO uh, reading just from uh, st standard uh, input um, file descriptor. If someone would, if the application would try to read from another uh, file descriptor, like under file descriptor, I mean um, open it, open it file handle. Uh, if an application would uh, attempt to read from different uh, file, then standard input, it uh, it wouldn't be allowed. It would, that uh, system call would be called uh, kill. Control groups. Uh, so far, we have uh, talked about uh, namespaces like uh, like uh, splitting one big building into rooms and uh, uh, capabilities like uh, defining what processes like running programs can do. Uh, now we uh, will mention how to um, allocate. The um, resources to those uh, programs, like I don't know, memory. How, how many memory it, uh, the process will be able to use, or which devices uh, that the program will be able to uh, access, or uh, which uh, uh, CPU cores, uh, which concrete uh, running program will be able to use. Like you have multi-core system, and uh, you would like to split. This, this program to be run just on these two cores and dedicate the rest to the whole operating system. And uh, this is how, how the control groups are defined. Uh, in the uh, control group config file, we specify some section like uh, earthly memory use. So we, for example, request that uh, that process would uh, would be able to use um, at maximum 200 uh, uh, megabytes. Uh, we restart the uh, control group config service to um, actualize the configuration. Uh, we check uh, list control group, we check uh, the new control group we have just created. The operating system knows about it. Like uh, after after the restart, the new restrict mem control group would be displayed, and finally, we execute some some process in that uh, uh, control group. Like we specify control group execute uh, memory memory resource. We are uh, we are requesting memory resource to be um, how to say managed, and uh, the control group that should be used is restrict memory, and we specify some, some uh, um, binary that this control group should, should be applied to. This is one example, control group exec is one example of uh, way how to execute uh, a process with uh, or program with the control group, but it's possible to create another config file uh, for the CD uh, red uh, daemon and uh, in that config file, we basically specify uh, each time you run uh, Firefox, uh, assign it to these three control groups. Each time you run, I don't know, uh, a PDF viewer, assign this, assign it to an, these another three control groups. You can you can specify a mapping uh, like uh, uh, when running this program, uh, assign it to uh, these control groups. And by starting that uh, daemon uh, and starting that uh, program, you don't need to take care. It, it, the operating system would take take care for you that when that program is run, it would be each time Firefox would be executed, it would uh, it would be able to use uh, you know, 200 uh, megabytes of memory. And max. Uh, that's just example. We will proceed to uh, sandbox and isolation like uh, uh, application platform. And I will mention GNOME, uh, the effort of GNOME sandboxed applications. Basically, there are 
Two goals. Um, create some way how to allow uh, third parties uh, to di distribute applications uh, like uh, on uh, multiple operating systems and uh, run the applications in the way like you that application would require at least uh, at, at as minimum from the operating from the hosting operating system as possible and the technologies used there are basically I have uh, list before right control groups, Linux namespaces, SL Linux and KD bus. I, I won't uh, you know, speak much about that one because it's not uh, uh, related that much to this project. So uh, GNOME setbook set applications is based on uh, uh, basically there are two categories of um, how to say applications. Uh, one category is runtime. It's, it's the environment that is intended to host the end user applications. And the second second category is something uh, like application bundle. That is the uh, that represents the concrete code of the end user application. Like uh, runtime would be environment that is able to uh, run application based. I don't know. On, at the concrete GNOME version, and application bundle would be that concrete GNOME application, like GEDID or and, and any some other example. And there are there are um, uh, software development software development kits SDKs S SDKs are a special type of runtime uh, category in the sense it contains parts like for building and uh, distributing the, uh, applications, those application bundles, like uh, develop, the developer files, you need to be able to compile that application, co com uh, concrete compiles and uh, things like that. Uh, maybe that uh, application bundle, how it looks like, it has some metadata that uh, actual application files uh, exported files and uh, building uh, an application in this environment means uh, ins install the software de development kit, build the application, uh, uh, and build the application against that installed SDK using the prefix uh, slash app. The tools like uh, the tool which is used for performing this task is, is called XD, XDG8. Um, I'm not sure if it's it's based on OS3, uh, operating system three. It's like um, very 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 simply uh, told. It's uh, uh, distributing operating system via Git, like like Git versions. You uh, when uh, you install. A new version you completely replace uh, the for the former version of the of the operating system. Uh, the XD, XDG application is able to ensure the isolation of the application from the hosting operating system, uh, provides the runtime for the, for those applications, and uh, contains tools for building and distribution of those application bundles. Here are the details. Uh, uh, all the all the processes that are launched in the in the XDG app sandbox are don't have any capabilities. Uh, there are some bind mounts, uh, some some uh, very very limited set of uh, devices are accessible within within that uh, runtime. Uh, basically, that environment uh, restricts those uh, permissions as much as it, uh, as is possible. Like, for example, mounts are uh, mounted with special options and uh, read only. Uh, this is another way of uh, creating or another way, another proposal how to how the um, sandbox. 
application platforms might look like. It's basically from the system D uh, developers, and uh, their point was uh, like right now there are there is the approach of so-called toolbox uh, upstream uh, toolbox software delivery in the sense that the upstream creates the tarball and uh, the distribution builds those binary packages and uh, distributes them. Uh, and the second approach is uh, is that in the sense like uh, the users, the end users don't uh, really care uh, uh, like uh, how about, about the way how the how they can download or receive the binary like in the in the form of, in which format it will be provided. But what they care uh, for is how quickly it will be updated when there is a security flaw. And uh, uh, so they are trying to be able to get it as, as soon as possible and the software vendor should be just responsible for keeping that application updated when there is some security issue, uh, a new version will be released. Uh, the goal of the of this proposal the goals of this proposal is uh, are like this like efficient way for packaging the software uh, it should be easy to install it should be universal solution like uh, uh, it will be applicable to all op operating system the the method should uh, be able to um, distribute operating system containers and user application in the, it shouldn't be restricted, and uh, prefer preferred it's when it uh, would allow the images to, to be signed. And uh, here's here's uh, a scheme how it might look. Uh, it might look like like uh, the booting of the operating system would mean uh, basically. Okay. It's the next slide. Uh, uh, on this slide, uh, that uh, approach is using uh, selected con uh, concept of the Butterfly uh, and Linux uh, file system name spacing. Basically, the only difference when you see the, those uh, red rows is just they differ in the in the first first section, like uh, and each of those uh, parts is here to identify different uh, uh, content to be contained with, with that, within that uh, butterfly uh, subvolume. And this is this is an example of how in that proposal the putting of such an operating system would look like. Like it's it's uh, when you go through, uh, it's it can be visible that. You basically operate on, uh, instead of uh, performing different actions, you operate on um, mounting points. Uh, I don't know, listing listing users mean uh, just list, just uh, create a list of uh, available user mount points and things like that. Uh, this is an interesting approach. And it's a um, uh, university project uh, created at uh, Harvard University. It's called CIS 50. And uh, the architecture of that sandbox it's, it's based on asynchronous HTTP server. Uh, the, it might look strange, like you, you want to create a sandbox and you would uh, create it as, as a service. and it might bring another another problems like uh, how to secure the communi communication with that server. Uh, in the moment you know that uh, the program you are trying to run is secure, but how to secure you know the, the transmission between between the server and uh, your local system? So uh, it consists of uh, three parts like sandbox, uh, run, and check. I will probably um, mention the goals that uh, were um, inspiring the, the proposal. And it's basically that this project 
also accessible after after the we have we added a URL. The the goals for this project were like uh, there is some computer science course at at the university, and the students are creating many many programs during during the semester. Like I don't know in Python, in C, in uh, who or whatever, whatever language it's compiled and interpreted language, uh, and they need uh, some way how those uh, evaluate those created uh, applications and check uh, they they work like it was requested they to work, and uh, what they need to do to ensure is to um, run those applications with, without the fear when run uh, to uh, damage the operating system uh, it, it will be run on so they might want to limit resource com com consumption uh, ensure things like the application would, wouldn't uh, crash the operating system because it's it's environment uh, shared between multiple multiple uh, users so prevent uh, denial of services And it's basically all. We have time for two questions. Who's first? The, the thing that came from, from System D with using PathRFS for, for, different, for different types of compartments, uh, how far are they in? developing this or is this just the concept or we, we see this in the over here? As far as I, uh, the question was uh, the proposal from the system, the system D guys uh, based on uh, B3, B3FS subvolumes, how, how far we are in, the, in, the, that, in that effort, in the implementation. As far as I know it was just a proposal like uh, I didn't uh, check recently but uh, uh, if it's possible to download uh, some the source code from somewhere, but uh, as as far as I know, it was uh, just a meeting of those of those guys to propose new way how to deliver software, like not the traditional way, but uh, not like you wouldn't uh, depend on the operating system or or the form the uh, binaries are distributed. But the only thing you want is to be able to produce the code as soon as possible, like you create it, the developer creates it and the users are able to instantly download it, like, and uh, the vendor should just uh, take care for the, for the update. Because that's the problem of the classical approach is like, the upstream creates a new version and it takes one year, one year and a half, when till this new version actually gets into, into the, Distribution be content yeah, because the packaging is different. Yeah, 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 yeah. Have to do work. Yeah, but uh, I, I don't know the exact state, but don't think like there is some demo available. You are, you would be able to try. But not yet, like. Last question. I would have another one. <laughs> uh, um, so I'm really curious about this because. For example, I keep my, my PGP private key air get on an SD card. I can be super paranoid about it. Um, but the, the thing why I do that is basically because as soon as I plug in my SD card, I have the fear that all the programs that are running under my user can do whatever I can do and possibly read the private key out, out, of, my, out, of, out of the backup SD card. And I think it would be a uh, quite a valid use case to to use this and say, well, I I have inserted the SD card, I have this mount point, and this mount point can be only used by the, the processes that I say, and those processes at the same time can't use the network because I don't want my private key to be leaked. So is there something out there that can do this, or do I have to write it my own? Or? Um, basically, the question was, like, if it's possible to um, Restrict the mount uh, locations to processes, to concrete processes, or uh, 
prevent other processes to be able to access uh, some concrete bound. Yeah. Okay. And the answer is it's yes. There is like uh, when you create the new amount, the mount namespace via the unshare utility, uh, you can you can specify that uh, other other processes can't can't share or can't uh, access that that mount uh, mount point. So it would be. An alternative, if you trust this sandbox, you don't need your target computer. I can, I can, maybe even find that option. There is a uh, mount namespace, and you need to specify when you create uh, the new namespace. You need to call uh, make r private or mar make uh, r slave to explicitly tell it uh, not to uh, sh um, how to say not to share it uh, outside uh, of the with, with the the rest of the operating system. It's it's. The, um, Described in the, in the manual page. Not sure if it's sufficient, or maybe we can we can talk after like how how this could be created. Thank you again, and see you all at the after party on Vagcastify. Should be cool. Thank you.